Tom Schnell, we're standing in front of a Soviet-era Mil Mi-2 helicopter here in the United States, and it's a working aircraft. Tell us about this aircraft and what you do with it. So this helicopter, like you said, is a hoplite. It's the uh, NATO designation. It's a uh, test bed for us. We test brand new cutting edge avionics, things that allow helicopter pilots to see in degraded visual environments. We have set it up in such a way that we can test new concepts very quickly in the early design stages rather than waiting too long. We can go and fly them very easily, fly sensors in all sorts of weather conditions and then change software or symbologies accordingly and go into production with a system that we know will actually work in the real world in real conditions. Give us some specifics about some of the equipment you have. I know there's LIDAR, there's a lot of different very high-tech things on this aircraft. What do you have and what are you doing with them? So kind of doing a round through the cockpit uh, in the instrument panel, you will find a Blackhawk glass cockpit. It's a Collins Aerospace MFDs. They're called MFD 268s. There's also a data entry unit, a DTU, and a data loader cartridge, just like you would find in a Blackhawk. So it's guaranteed the only MI2 in the world that has a Blackhawk cockpit. And that opens up a lot of capabilities in terms of connecting sensors that provide imagery or uh, point clouds to the glass cockpit. But then in addition, and I didn't bring the helmet with me, but we have a helmet display that you can plug in and it too becomes a display surface. Wherever your head is moving, we're tracking the head movements and then we put graphics into the display commensurate to what you would see out the window if you could see. So think of uh, yourself flying in degraded visual environments like even nighttime or in fog. With that helmet display, you're now overlaying symbologies of obstacles, power lines, towers, the landing zone, waypoints, all sorts of things that could ruin your day or that you need to go and land and complete your mission successfully is now literally in front of your face, much like an Iron Man mask. Uh, so we augment reality with that helmet. Kind of in the middle section of the helicopter, you see a rack full of equipment. All this equipment is piled up, making the front end look like a production ready avionics suite. And that is the early life cycle testing that I mentioned. We literally write the software and we go fly it the next hour to test the reaction of the pilots and things that they want to change. In the back you have two seats where typically our flight test engineers ride along and they're the ones that run the equipment in the back room to make the front room function appropriately for the mission. The aircraft is also equipped with outriggers. You see them on the left and on the right side of the helicopter uh, on specially furnished hard points and on those we can pile up uh, sensors very quickly. We carry them externally and you'll see that the cables of the sensors go right through the window. So we don't need to mess around with bulkhead connectors and uh, crimping wires. We just run it right in through the window. And so we can accommodate the customer's requirements to go test the sensor very quickly. On the left outrigger, you'll see a, a LiDAR made by a company called Hensolt in Germany. And it's a seven kilowatt pulsing LiDAR that's also scanning and it's eye safe because the pulses are very short. And as we're flying al along, this LiDAR makes a 3D model of the world of every object bigger than 15 centimeters in size in 3D. That means as I'm ingressing into a landing zone and I'm painting obstacles, I now generated a data set that I can actually transmit to someone else. And since it's truly three dimensional, even if that other person comes from another direction, they can spin that model around and use it for their own ingress into that same landing zone, even though they might not have such a LiDAR on board. And that means also we have data links on board to transmit this data. Why did you choose this particular bird for the missions that you're trying to accomplish? I wanted an affordable helicopter and, and one that's reliable and easy to fly. 
the MI2 actually meets those markers. You know, some people call them ugly. I will say, don't call my helicopter ugly. It's a really neat helicopter. I bought this one for $65,000 and the one next to it for $35,000. And by the way, they are fully flyable and they're probably some of the nicest MI2s, I would say, in the world. Very easy to fly. I mentioned the handling qualities of the MI2. They're really stable. You don't need a stability augmentation system. They are stable inherently. I mean, you can truly take your hands off the wheel, so to speak, and they, they will not get out of control real fast. And that's a, a good feature to have when you do flight into brownout, which we have done. We've taken these to the Yuma Desert and literally plunged them into full-on brownout. We used for that a particle separator on the intake of the engine that's working a little bit like a Dyson vacuum cleaner with the centrifugal spinning methodology and, and that was 100% efficient for us to go fly into and loiter in the brownout and literally suck that dust through the particle separator and we just sit there looking with that Iron Man helmet into the landing zone and you could not do this without uh, such electronic assistance. Are you a private company or are you affiliated with a university or who's helping fund all this research? I work for the University of Iowa. I'm a professor in industrial and systems engineering and all professors have to do teaching, research and service. I do a lot of research and that is what I do in, in my lab, the operator performance laboratory at the University of Iowa. We have 11 aircraft. That's uh, six manned aircraft and five unmanned aircraft. So we're actually very much involved in manned, unmanned teaming procedures and, and research along those lines and also how you integrate unmanned aircraft into the national airspace. The funding is all external. So we go out and find funding with NASA, the FAA, the military, private companies, and, and we are truly a, a soft money funded externally funded enterprise at the University of Iowa. What is the end product for all of this? When you develop a new piece of software, who are you developing that for? Well, I can give you one example that I feel is a really good uh, success story. In probably 2004 to 2006, we developed software, a synthetic vision system that we brought up here to Oshkosh, showed it in the NASA pavilion, some people showed up and were interested. We sold them a license to it, and that company is called Dynon, and it became Skyview. Uh, it makes me extremely proud to see how they took our product, a, a research output product, and turned it into a, an extremely viable uh, system that you probably see in every other airplane. You walk around here at, at the uh, AirVenture has a Skyview system in it. So that, that would be one way uh, that we might have an actual software product that you can transition into a commercialized uh, platform. Sometimes it's just a concept of operation. We, we go out and we figure out a new symbology. For example, we have fighter trainers that have an F-35 helmet integrated to it. Guaranteed the only L-29s with an F-35 helmet and we study symbologies for F-35 pilots because you can't easily do that in an actual F-35. So in, in that way, our test beds support difficult questions that avionics designers and sensor uh, manufacturers might have towards integrating into avionics. Aero TV is brought to you by Evolution means avionics for innovators. As an aircraft designer, don't let your vision be constrained by someone else's limitations. Instead, let Avolution help your dreams become your customer's reality. www.avolution.com